it is so good to be with those of you in the room and with those online. We're so grateful to be together uh, in this moment with you. And I just got to just pause right now and just chuckle at something. And this is going to just sound super not spiritual. Um, so I'm just going to tell you that right now. Um, I, I got a little, uh, had a, I laughed at myself because this is where I went. Um, after seeing all the Chiefs jerseys in the room today and uh, hearing the songs that we were singing, Chain Breaker, uh, Battle Belongs to the Lord, and See a Victory. <laughs> I was like, people might think that we're singing this thinking that we can um, praise God and get an outcome in today's game. <laughs> um, actually, those songs Ryan had prepared before, we knew the Chiefs were going to be in today's playoffs, and it was about today's topic, and so it was, I was getting a little chuckle, and it, it really, this is the super unspiritual part of me. Um, um, you ready? So when we got to that part of the song, we're in Sea of Victory, and it says, uh, no weapon formed against you will prosper, and I was like, God, let no quarterback formed against us prosper. <laughs> okay. Now that you saw the unspiritual side of me, my name's Casey, for those of you who are new, and I'm just an everyday guy. So, um, so glad that you're here, and if you're watching online, we're so grateful that you're here. Even if you're new online, we're grateful that you're here too. And I do wanna let all of those that are new with us today and online, let you know that hey, we, we wanna be a church family that is for you. We want you to feel accepted, challenged, and encouraged to follow Jesus. We, ha- we want you to experience um, what we've experienced in, in, in the community of, in, in, in the love of God and being in a community that follows Jesus together. And we hope that you experience the, the, the life that is involved that. Also, we have a gift for you today. Um, so because you're new with us and you took the courage to make some time out of your day to be a part uh, of today with us and be together with us, we have a gift for you. At the end of the service, Uh, For those in the room, if you'll take the connect card that's located in the seat back of the chair in front of you and take it to the host that will be at the welcome table, um, we'd love to give you a gift for being with us today. And those online, just let them know, indicate uh, they're putting a connect card there. You can fill that out. That's how we can get you that gift for being uh, with us and letting us share this time with you together uh, today. So, hey, Westside, let's give all of those that are new with us in the room and those watching online, let them know how grateful we are that we get to share this moment with them. Will you do that? Yeah. So we've been in this series um, called Burn the Ships, and we've been looking at the life that Jesus wants us to experience as we follow him, because that's what he wants you to experience. He wants you to experience life because that's what he came to bring. This is what God is, is life. And he wants you to experience the fullness of who he is. And this is a series, big idea that we've been looking at over the last several weeks, that we experience true freedom and fulfillment when we completely trust in Jesus as our savior and wholeheartedly commit to following Jesus as Lord. That this is when we experience that true freedom. We experience that freedom and fulfillment when we put our trust completely in Jesus as our Savior. And there's this wholehearted commitment to follow him as our Lord. And and so what does this mean that we'll do? So we're not going to longingly look back because of what Jesus has for us and the freedom and fulfillment of what he brings us. We're not going to longingly look back to that which Christ has set us free. And, And we're not going to longingly look back for this reason. So we don't go back to the life from which Christ has set us free. Now, in order to experience this freedom and to experience this fulfillment, we must learn something. We need to understand how our story is connected to God's story of how he created a people who will trust in him and he created a people who could experience his promise of full life. And so in this, we need to see how our story is connected to that story. And this is the reason we've been burning the ships. See, we've burned several ships that keep us from experiencing this freedom and fulfillment that God has for every one of us. We've been burning the ship on sin. We burned the ship a couple of weeks ago on comparison, how it's a trap. Uh, last week, we burned the ship on pleasing people. And today, we're gonna burn another ship. Today, we're gonna burn the ship on toxic, on toxic shame. We're gonna burn this ship of toxic shame that enters the harbors of our lives through destructive habits, through patterns or addictions, or even our past regrets in our poor decisions. See, when we look at God's story, when you look at the whole narrative of scripture and how we place, uh, see ourselves into this and we understand that, when we look at God's story, we can see how sin has brought brokenness into our lives. This is why it's so important to see ourselves in the picture of God's story and trying to see God in our story when you put ourselves in God's story. And if we don't turn to scripture, we won't know the true reason. You'll never know the true reason as to why brokenness is in our world, as to why brokenness is in your life, 
or even the reason that, that brokenness affects all of us or the, in people in general. See, without turning to scripture, we're not going to know why we experience the pain from past regrets. We'll know that we experience the pain, but we're not gonna understand why. If we don't turn to scripture, we're not gonna go know why we get stuck into destructive patterns or destructive habits. We're not gonna know why that we keep on going from one toxic relationship into another toxic relationship. If we don't turn to scripture, we're not gonna know why we suffer from the pain that is caused by the selfish choices and decisions of those closest to us. See, when we turn to scripture, we see something. We see that in the beginning of time, God created a world so we could experience life, which was freedom and fulfillment. See, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were free and fulfilled in God's good and perfect design. This was good. This was perfect. Actually, the writer says this in Genesis 1.31. It says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. See, God saw the earth. He saw the first five days, of uh, all he created in the first five days. And he saw the earth, he saw the universe, all the systems, how the ecosystem kind of worked together, how he designed it all to work together. He saw the animals and, 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 and God said all of this was good. But when God saw humanity, when he put his eyes on the very thing that was in the very being that was made in his image, God said something different. He said it was very good. And let me interject something here. See, let me interject the reason I believe that this is God's story. And what we read here in Genesis is not just something made up or a philosophy that was man-made. See, Jesus' resurrection for me, and I believe this is for you, Jesus' resurrection, it verifies that his words are true. Jesus' resurrection validates Genesis because Genesis, Jesus quoted from the book of Genesis and affirmed its truth. And this is why I trust this narrative. This is why I trust that this narrative tells us who is the creator and why he created all that he created. See, scripture tells us that our story Genesis tells us that our story started out very good. And this is important to know. It was perfect. And scripture tells us more about our story too. In verse 15 of chapter two, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free. Just stop right there for a second. Free. Commanded the man. You are free free. In the beginning of time, before sin entered the world, he put him in the garden to work it. There was purpose and there was, there was fulfillment, satisfaction, and there was freedom. You are free to, ex, to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Just like a parent telling a son or a daughter or a child to go, like they go to this huge park or this huge playground and they say, you can play wherever you want. You are free to be wherever you want. Just don't cross the street. Don't enter the street. Just don't cross the fence. See, in this, freedom was experienced within the boundaries God had given. Life was good. Life was perfect. Adam and Eve were free. Adam and Eve we're fulfilled. And we see this as the writer poetically puts this and illustrates this in, cha in chapter two, verse 25, that Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. No shame. I mean, can you imagine that with me? It's hard for us to imagine. Can you imagine how good this would have been to have no shame? No shame from a past decision or, or a series of poor decisions that have mounted up into a big regret. No shame from, ever, from, from not measuring up to the expectations of others. No shame from seeing our bodies imperfectly. No shame from an addiction. No shame from the pain caused by the poor decisions of those that are close to us. No shame. All was very good until... Satan convinced Adam and Eve that God was wrong. There was no shame until 
Satan convinced Adam and Eve that God was wrong about what he said. Now the serpent we read in chapter three, verse one, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? Just pause right here. You know what Satan's oldest trick in the book is? It's to get humanity to question God. Isn't it interesting that today there's more questions about the existence of God than any? It's the oldest trick in the book. Think about that. We read on in verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees of the garden, but God did say, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it, which God didn't say you must not touch it. She added that or that came in somewhere later or you will die. And in this moment, Satan says, you will not, you certainly not die. Satan said to the woman, serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit was, of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So Adam was there this entire time. And for those of you who want to blame Eve for sin and want to blame woman for the sin we got to realize Adams was standing right there and they were both guilty. See, Satan caused both Adam and Eve to doubt God. And that doubt led both Adam and Eve to not believing that God's words were true. You know what? Sin is the result of not believing that God is who he said he was and not believing that his words are true. See, sin is not believing in God and his truth. And because we don't believe, we don't obey. It was because Adam and Eve didn't believe that they didn't obey. They didn't trust God. They trusted Satan's words, a serpent's words more than they trusted God. That's why they obeyed Satan's words and didn't obey God. They trusted what Satan said. And I believe the reason they trusted what Satan said is because it what Satan said aligned with a desire that was inside of them, a desire that's inside of all of us, a desire that we want to be God. We want that place of authority. We want that place of control. We want to call the shots our way. We don't want anything or anyone over us. And a lot of times we we, we get in that time. And, and, and many times, even our doubts, we doubt God's word. And this is the thing that's interesting. See, we doubt God's word because we want something else to be true because that's the way we want it. We want it to be this way. And so we disbelieve. I don't believe that because that's not the way I want it to be. And a lot of times we got doubt God's word and God, that doubt can lead to unbelief. See, doubt actually is not a bad thing, but what it leads to can be a bad thing. See, doubt is not bad, it's unbelief that is bad. Unbelief doesn't just lead to sin, unbelief is our sin. And Satan convinced Adam and Eve that they lacked something. They didn't trust that God was good and that his ways were good. And Satan twisted the truth. And while they didn't die in that immediate moment, they didn't die in a physical death, something did die. When Adam and Eve sinned by not believing in God and disobeying him, sin broke the image of God in them. And the image of God in all of humanity was destroyed at that moment. And our relationship with God, their relationship with God was immediately severed. See, when that happened, something was taken, something was stolen, something was ripped from humanity. Something so big, something so powerful was removed and the human life now has a bottomless pit that will be an eternal void that nothing else can fill. See, sin created a bottomless pit in humanity to be loved and to find worth. 
Sin created this bottom of the pit. It, it was at the moment that unbelief brought sin that this, this void, this vacuum, this bottomless pit was unearthed in everyone that would ever be born. It was unearthed in Adam and Eve and therefore in all of us. It was a need, a bottomless pit to be loved. It was a bottomless pit that would never be fulfilled like it was in the beginning. Two bottomless pits of, of to, to be loved and find worth. And see, love, before sin entered the world, love was found in relationships. We see this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, that the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone, so I will make a helper suitable for him. That help me is, is, is this, this, this one that would be there and there would be a, a bond there. See, humanity was created to receive the perfect love from God so that we can give that love to each other. We were created to receive an infinite source of love from God and be able to give of that love to one another. However, sin broke our relationship with our source of love. Sin broke that relationship with this infinite source of love and now all of our relationships suffer the consequence. We suffer from not being able to fill this bottomless pit, which is this infinite need to be loved. And so what do we do? We search to fill this bottomless pit to be loved. We search, search for sources to fill this bottomless pit. To, to, and we long to be loved. And our search leads many people from one relationship to another relationship because we have this bottomless pit of love. We also have this bottomless pit of worth, the second bottomless pit. And see, worth was found in purpose. We see this before sin entered in Genesis 1, verse 26, that, that, that the worth, because worth, when you know your purpose, your life has value. When you know your purpose, your life has meaning. And when you know your purpose, your life has worth. We see in Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. See that? In our likeness, there's the purpose. And your purpose made in the image of God has a calling so that your purpose is not, is, is, yes, to be in the image of God. Your purpose is, and when you reflect the image of God, you give him glory. So that, he says, the writer says, they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all, creation, all the creatures that move along the ground. We were made in the image of God and we were made for a purpose. And our purpose is one, to reflect the image of God. Two, to be under God's authority. That's our purpose. And three, it's to under that authority have and rule over all that God has given us. But now our brokenness has created a bottomless pit to find worth. A bottomless pit to search for significance, a bottomless pit to find value. And so what do we do? We work harder to fill the bottomless pit by achieving things or, or succeeding in things. And, and yet it's never fulfilled in what we do. And these bottomless pits that could not be filled by anything in our own doing has caused something. We read this in verse seven. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. See, before, the writer beautifully tells us they, they were naked and they felt no shame. And now the author says they see their nakedness and this poetically implies they now feel shame. So, they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? See, Adam and Eve realized that they were naked, and now they realized their shame. They saw the image of God was broken and they do what every one of us try to do when we experience our shame. We try to cover it up ourselves. I mean, that's what we do with shame, isn't it? We try to cover it up ourselves. And you know what else we do? We, we hide it from everyone else, including God. 
We think we can even hide it from him. We cover up and we try to cover up and we, we try to cover it up in our, th- those closest to us and then we try to hide from those, especially him who we need the most. See, they tried to hide their shame from each other and they tried to hide their shame from God. See, shame is the result of God's image being broken. That's what sin leads to. Sin leads to shame and sin leads to brokenness and death. And sin is any time that we want to live life according to our own design. It's any time that we want to live life according to what we want more than what God wants and not trust or believe in God's perfect design or in his ultimate authority. And any time, any time you and I resist God's authority, it's because we don't believe in who he is and we don't believe in his authority. And it's that moment that we sin. And sin always leads to shame. Sin always leads to brokenness and death. And sin always destroys. In Genesis 3, we learn that sin is the reason for all the brokenness in the world. See, sin opened the floodgates of brokenness in our world. Sin opened the floodgates of brokenness in our bodies. It's why sickness and death reign. And sin opened the brokenness and the floodgates of brokenness in our relationships, first with God and then second with each other because sin destroys. Sin destroys our relationships. Sin destroys our marriages. Sin destroys our sexuality. Sin destroys our finances. And it's all because sin destroyed our relationship with God. And what do we do? Just like Adam and Eve, we try to fix it ourselves. We try to make the fig leaves and try to cover it up. We, we try to escape or even fix our own brokenness. And so we try to escape our guilt. We try to escape out of our shame. We try to fix our own brokenness with broken solutions. We try to fix the pain. We try to mitigate the pain and escape the shame of being unfulfilled or being unloved. And we go to broken solutions to fill our bottomless pits. And this leads to so many broken solutions. To, for some, it leads to the broken solutions of a drink and they drink too much or they take too many pills. This is why some gamble, they try to gamble their way out of, of, what, they, of what they broke. And so they, because they wanna find security again. Many try to cover up the pain in their marriage or the pain in a relationship or pain of not being loved and they try to cover it up with an image on the screen. We develop destructive habit of spending money to cover up the emptiness that we feel inside, a broken solution. We try to fix our own broken image by jumping from one toxic relationship to another. Many people turn to substances, to sexual pleasure, to work all to restore the brokenness the, and fill the bottomless pits and relieve the pain of shame. Substances become substitutes. They become substitutes for freedom and fulfillment. And it's, only when, it's the only way we think that we can feel that we can deal with the pain is put a substitute in the place. It's the only way we believe can we can deal with the pain of our own shame. See, the bottle becomes the only way that we can deal with the pain of loneliness or maybe the, the, it becomes the only solution that we trust for the momentary relief from the pain of our past regrets. And some people turn to food. Some people will turn to food to relieve that pain of not feeling loved or the f- pain of not having worth or purpose. Some turn to sexual pleasure to fill their bottomless pits. And sexual pleasure becomes a pursuit to experience, a broken pursuit to experience the fulfillment of love or the purpose and fulfillment of power. See, we abandon God's design for our sexuality and we pursue our own design. We pursue what pleases our eye and we go after what brings us momentary freedom and just momentary fulfillment. Others like me, we, we turn to work to feel fulfilled, to feel significant. And we, we try to fill the bottomless pit with a broken, per, with a broken solution to, to our purpose and our worth. 
All we end up doing is destroying the relationships around us. We break the relationship with our spouses. We, we hurt the relationship with our kids in pursuit of finding ourselves in our work and finding ourselves in our own success. See, my addiction to achievement causes me to abandon my limitations. And then I try to fix my own brokenness by working more. It's a broken solution for a bottomless pit. I see my own broken image and I believe that if I work harder to hide my insecurities and cover them up, (laughs) that that will fix it. But it doesn't. It just destroys things. And we only find out that working more, more, trying to fill these bottomless pits for worth, the purpose, and whatever pursuit, the whatever broken solution only creates a larger appetite. And it only causes that to grow. See, these bottomless pits create an unquenchable, an unquenchable desire to be filled. That's what bottomless pits do. They just create an unquenchable, an unquenchable desire to be filled. So what do we do? We turn to these broken solutions to cover up or fill our broken bottomless pits. Now, I know that there are some in this room who may deal with addictions or habits and, and the, it may have started off in covering up shame, but maybe it's turned into something of a physiological struggle. And I just want you to know that you're not alone and, and you don't have to do this alone and we'd love to help you. And it's not something you can just believe your way out of. We know that there is something that you need more of and we'd love to help you find the solutions to, those bat- to that battle that you face. See, all of these pursuits are pursuits to escape or fix our brokenness and every one of our broken solutions leads to shame. And when we experience shame, it's a signal, it's a sign It's a sign of our brokenness and sin. See, this is the indicator on the dashboard of our life. Anytime that you and I feel shame, anytime you and I feel shame, it's an indicator of the brokenness and sin in our world. It's an indicator of the brokenness and the sin in us. And it's an indicator of the brokenness and the sin that affects all of us from the poor decisions and the sins of others. And today we need to burn the ship on shame. We all need to burn the ship on shame. We all are addicts to what we believe can fill these bottomless pits. We all are addicts to what we believe can fix our help and help us escape our brokenness. We're all addicts to what we think will bring momentary freedom and momentary fulfillment. And isn't it interesting that what we experience today is the same thing that Adam and Eve experienced when they didn't trust God, when they didn't believe in him? shame. We all experience it. And today we're going to burn the ship on shame. See, when we turn to anything other than God to restore our brokenness, we create what scripture would call an idol. See, only God can be our source of love and our source of purpose. And anything you put in a substitute for God is an idol. That's what an idol is. It's a substitute for the real thing. And any time you and I put uh, something in the place that would fill this bottomless pit, see, only God can be your source of love and only God can be your source of purpose. And anything else that you turn to to fill this bottomless pit of love, to fill the bottomless pit of purpose becomes an idol, becomes a God to you. And this is the power of shame. See, shame motivates us to fill our bottomless pits with substitutes, And the shame, the emptiness is the source of our addictions many times. And it's what causes us to stay in our destructive habits. Addictions and habits trap us into believing that a substance, that a relationship, that an activity can fill the bottomless pit to feel worth and can fill the bottomless pit that we all have to be loved. And our emptiness creates a drive to find what only God can bring us. Your emptiness, that bottomless pit, creates this unquenchable drive to find what only God can bring you. See, your emptiness, your bottomless pit, drives you to find significance. It's what drives us to find purpose. It's what drives us to seek love. and what drives us to find value or to find worth, to find freedom, to find fulfillment, and to find life. A life that is not in broken solutions, 
My friend and counselor, Dr. Mike Grubbs, writes in his book, Broken Chains, Freedom from Unwanted Habits and Addictions. He's someone who's been up here at our church to speak a couple times. He writes this in the book, and I just wanna read this to you. He says, the result of those two bottomless pits in man's soul is that we employ all manner of wrong strategies in a relentless effort to do the impossible, to satisfy the insatiable emptiness of the soul apart from the God who made it. I wanna read that last line again. See, in a relentless effort, what we do, we employ these strategies to do the impossible, to satisfy the insatiable emptiness, to satisfy the unquenchable void of our soul apart from God who made it. See, we try to fill our bottomless pits with everything but God. And this is what humanity keeps trying to do. This is what we keep trying to do. We keep trying to fill our broken bottomless pits by turning to broken solutions over and over again. We keep trying to fill this need to be loved. We keep trying to fill this need to have worth that's in our purpose in all of this. And I want you to know something. Only something infinite can fill something that's bottomless. Only something and someone who's infinite can fill the bottomless pit in your and my life. God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah to Israel and he addressed their condition, a condition that's much like the condition of all of us. And when God speaks through Jeremiah to this nation who's in exile, they have no worth. They feel God doesn't love them and they feel like nobody else loves them. This is what God says to them through the prophet Jeremiah. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. This is what my people have done. They've forsaken me. I'm the source of living water. They, first, they don't believe that God is their source. So what do they do? They reject God who is their source of life. He is the spring of living water. See, only living water can bring life. And what else did they do? They turned from God in their rejection <laughs> and they turned to broken solutions, broken substitutes and broken solutions as they dig their own cisterns to fill their life with, only, with what only God could provide. And what, that's what we do, isn't it? We fill and dig and search and to fill our lives with the false sources of love and worth. And so what we find are just broken solutions, empty ways that we think lead to freedom and fulfillment, but they don't. And so here's a teaching big idea that I wanna leave you with. See, God promises to be an infinite source of life to fill your bottomless pits of love and purpose when you turn to him. See, God promises to be the infinite source of life. God is the spring of living water and he alone promises to be the only source, the infinite source of love and the infinite source of worth and purpose for your bottomless pit. I love what Jesus would do. Jesus would identify himself as this source of living water to a woman who would meet him at the famous well of Jacob. See, she thought she was just going there to get water, but Jesus had positioned himself because he saw her ahead of time. And Jesus in this moment asked this woman for a drink. And she asked, and then she asked Jesus, and in this um, and what Jesus does, and Jesus then what he says, hey, if you know who you were talking to, you would be asking me for a drink. And then she looks at Jesus and says, are you greater than Jacob, our father, who dug this well? And listen to what Jesus says. I didn't put this in your notes. It's in John 4, but listen to this because it's for you. 
everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. It's talking about the well of Jacob. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This woman had a bottomless pit. In her search for love and purpose, she jumped from one toxic relationship to another. Jesus identifies that when he calls out that she's been married five times and the man that she's with now is not even her husband. She had a bottomless pit that, that of love and of worth and she used relationships to fill this and Jesus points out that only he is the infinite source to her bottomless pit. See, Jesus is the spring of living water. So what do we do? What do we need to do when we suffer from the brokenness of shame that comes from anything, that comes from trying to fill these bottomless pits with anything or anyone other than God? This is what I want you to do. When you want, when you have that desire to go to the substitute, when you have to that desire to go to this, whether it's, a, a, whether it's a, another relationship, whether it's a substance, whether it's a website or an app, whether it's your desire to work harder or longer or it's a food, whatever, whenever you go to that substitute, this is what I want you to do. I want you to first stop and turn. I want you to first stop and turn. And I want you to do this. I want you to turn to Jesus because I will only turn to Jesus, my living source of life who loves me. And he alone gives me purpose. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna turn. I'm not gonna turn to that substitute. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna turn only to Jesus. He is my living source of life who loves me and gives me purpose. So, and I'm gonna first stop and turn because he's that infinite source of love and purpose. And secondly, I'm going to look up and confess. So first I'm gonna stop and turn. And then secondly, I'm gonna look up and confess. I'm gonna confess my sin to find healing from my shame. I'm gonna confess my sin because I want to be made whole. I want, the, I want that bottomless pit to be filled. So I gotta confess my sin to find the healing from my shame. See, the trick of the enemy is to keep you hiding your shame <laughs> and to keep you hiding your sin. That's the trick of the enemy because he knows confession leads to healing. Shame leads me to hide, not confide my sin. So what do we do? We need to look up and we need to confess, look up to God and confess to him. First John 1, 8 and 9 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful, he is faithful, he is faithful and he is just and will forgive us. Our, forgive us our sins. And I want you to circle this word and purify. Some of you need to realize that it's through your confession to God that his living source of water, his infinite source of water can penetrate the filthy, toxic, broken cisterns that have come. All these things that we try to fill this broken, the broken bottomless pit, it's just created havoc. He can purify us because he is the source of this. So look up and confess and be purified and then look up and confess to each other and be healed. James 5 says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. See, confession is the connection to experiencing freedom from your shame and your sin. Connect, confession is the connection to opening your life up to the healing flow of the living water that can fill your broken soul. That word healed can also be interpreted as cured or set free. He wants to do this for you. Don't hide it. Confide it. 
See, the power of healing is in the accountability that confession brings. And don't just confess to anyone. Let me just warn you. Confess to someone because the prayer of a righteous person is power effective. So confess to a strong Christ follower who knows that they stand in the righteousness of Jesus and not in the self-righteous pride. This is who we come to. This is who we can trust. Confess. Because while my shame causes me to hide, Jesus' grace gives me the courage to step away from the fig leaves, to step out of the garden of my shame and come to the source of living water who's there to fill the broken, heal my brokenness and fill the bottomless pit that I have. We're gonna sing a song. This is what I wanna ask you to do. I wanna ask you to stop and turn. Turn to Jesus right now. And for some of you who need to take this moment, confess, confess to him that you've turned to everything and anyone other than him. And you recognize that he's a source of your living water. Will you do that? as we sing about the reckless love of our God.